Good morning. The scripture reading today comes to us from Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 through 24. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of the, his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. For 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. Here ends the scripture reading for today. Praise be to God. I would garner a guess that most of you here have heard this story at some point. This is one of those ones we tend to teach really early, right? We love to teach Noah and the ark to our children. Which is interesting because it's kind of a dark story. Right? A lot of death, a lot of destruction. But there are cute, fuzzy animals that we can make little arcs out of it. So we love to teach it to kids. But as you can probably guess, we've been talking the last few weeks about forgotten people of the Bible. And when we look at the story of Noah's ark, I think the person that we always forget about, that we never think of, is Noah's wife. In fact, she is such a forgotten character that she doesn't even get a name, right? She's simply Noah's wife. Now, in Scripture, in the rabbinic text that would come out later, they do give her a name. They call her Nama or Nama. Okay? But in Scripture, in Genesis, she does not get a name. She is simply Noah's wife. Now, have you ever met somebody that has to deal with that distinction of being noted mostly as the spouse of somebody else? Yes. <laughs> You got a few? This, yes, this is Heather. <laughs> Not Pastor Steve's wife. This is Heather. I introduce myself sometimes as Heather's husband. And that's it. <laughs> nice and simple. We don't, we don't generally like that, right? We want to be who we are. We're not just... Uh, the wife, we're not just the spouse of someone, we're someone important. And so we hardly ever talk about Noah's wife. She's just sort of along for the ride in the story. So I want to kind of give her her just desserts today. We're going to discuss what we can take away from Scripture about who this person must have been. Because Scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot. But I think we can glean a lot from what we do know about what she must have been like and what we can learn from her about how we have to live into our faith, how we can be disciples, how we can be the church together. And one of the first things I think that I always notice is what I've kind of been speaking to, that she feels particularly underappreciated. Now, those of you who know history know that in 1955, there was an African-American woman who, on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, refused to give up her seat for a white gentleman. And so 
It led to a complete change in the way segregation happened in the South to a court case. And that woman's name was Rosa Parks. The woman on the screen is not Rosa Parks. The woman on the screen, her name is Claudette. Blanking on this name. Covlin? Cloven. What? Coke. Say it. Coquelin. Okay. I had it for the first two services. You think I'd have it? Claudette Coquelin. And why Claudette matters is because she did the exact same thing Rosa Parks did, but she did it nine months before Rosa Parks. Now, why do you have no idea who she is? It's because when she did it, she was 15 years old. And the NAACP decided she was not a good poster child because them darn teenagers are unreliable at best. And so they waited. And then when Rosa Parks came up, they used Rosa Parks. And so her name is sort of lost to history, right? And that happens a lot through history, right? We have people who did really important things who sort of get forgotten. Right, Because they weren't at the right place or the right time or in the right moment. And so what they did, the stand they took, the things they did can often be underappreciated, right? Have you ever had a moment in your life when you felt underappreciated? Okay? Maybe there's something as simple as, you know, you buy the, the Christmas gift for somebody. The Christmas gift that just jumps off the shelf where you were like, this is the perfect gift for that person. There has never been a gift more perfect than this. I'm going to get it for them. And then you spend like months excited to give them that gift. And then Christmas comes and you give them that gift. And they go, oh, well, thank you. And then that's it. You expected them to fall over, to be excited, to not be able to stop talking about what wondrous of a gift this is. And you feel underappreciated. There's obviously a lot more moments that happen. And that can even happen within the church, right? Even within the church, right? We can feel underappreciated for the things that we do, for the efforts that we take. And I think when we look at this story, that's the first thing I always come away with. How underappreciated Noah's wife is in all of this. And that even in that moment, we can understand because we felt that way too. And the first thing we need to do is to try to appreciate the efforts that people do take. This morning I took time to talk about Dwayne and Dana who run all of our tech stuff because uh, Dwayne had to come up and do like a pit stop change on me as my mic was going out. And I, They're here, they have to listen to three sermons a Sunday. I told Dwayne I should just have him come up and do it the third time. I'll just sit down. We have so many people, that's just one example, we have so many people in this church who do so many things. We have to make sure to take time to appreciate what people do. But in the moments that we are unappreciated, we have to remember that that's not why we do the things that we do. We do the things that we do because we are disciples of Jesus Christ and because God has called us to do them. With the understanding that, you know who never overlooks the things that you do? God. That's what scripture tells us. It says, People might forget. People might not notice what you do. But God sees all that you do. The good things and the bad things. But then when the time comes, you will get the reward for the things that you've done. So instead of lamenting the acknowledgement that we're getting on earth or from people who are flawed, we need to remember for whom we're doing the things that we do. And understand that it's God who does appreciate each and everything that we do on the behalf of the kingdom of God. And Noah's wife, even though scripture might not have appreciated her, I know God appreciated Noah's wife. And appreciates when we do things. And all that we do and all that we are. But her story isn't just about under, being underappreciated. It's what she does that matters. Heather helped out, or Heather led the kitchen at the rummage sale on Friday and Saturday. And so while she was doing that, I was home with the kids. (laughs) And I learned something. Children are insane. (laughs) And if you spend long enough with them, you too become insane. (laughs) Because you can only hear the word daddy said so many times in a row before something snaps. And you lose your sense and you become a crazy person, right? 
And so I have a lot of respect for what Heather does, right? Because I, I, after the last few days, I have much more of an understanding of this meme. <laughs> and I tell Heather that when I get home, my expectation and my hope is simply that the children are alive and she is sane. That's my bar. That's all I expect. I don't expect anything more. Dishes, laundry, food, whatever. As long as they're alive, it's impressive to me. And when we look at Noah's wife, I think we can assume that she played a large role in the raising of her family. I think that's a safe assumption to make. And what's amazing to note about this family is that in the entire world, this is the one family that God says they're worth saving. They're worth leaving because of their righteousness, because of what they do for God. And that has to be part of how she raised her children. That has to be part of what she has done as the matriarch of that family. That she has instilled a sense of righteousness. And I know this is true in my life. I've grown up, my dad is a pastor. But my spiritual guidance when I was a kid and a teenager growing up came mostly from my mother. Because my dad was pastor on Sunday, he was pastor to everyone during the week. And so probably the last thing he wanted to do when he got home was be pastor to the family. And so my mom was the one who would chastise me when I was going to go see a movie that maybe wasn't appropriate of, does Jesus really want you to have those thoughts in your head? Right? That was my mom. My mom was the one urging me to read my Bible, to do those sorts of things. And, and the same way, I'm sure that Noah's wife, mother of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, made a huge role in pulling them to be righteous people. Righteous people in a world that told them otherwise. In a world that was telling them they didn't have to be righteous people. That they could do anything that they wanted to do and it was fine because God didn't care and God didn't matter. She had to stand up and say there's a different way. That God is calling you to be better. That God is calling you to turn away from sin. Thankfully we now don't live in a world where we have those same problems do we? We are all responsible for taking on the mantle. Whether it's our children, whether it's grandchildren, or if we don't have children and grandchildren, it's that girl who rides her bike by our house every day. It's the young people, the teenagers. We are responsible to raise people saying that the things that they see in culture, the things that they see in the world that are not of God, they should turn from. And turn to God rather than away from God. So that when God looks at our families, looks at the people that we have touched. It's the same thing as in Noah. That we are righteous. That we have turned. Not that we're better than anyone else. Not that we're greater than anyone else. But that we make a concerted effort to turn towards God. When the world tells us we should turn away from God. That is is so much of how we are judged. That's what's so great about Noah's wife, that she has led a family that is turning towards God when everyone else is turning away. We need to call our world, call the people that we care about and the people we don't even know to turn away from the things that would seek to destroy them, to turn away from the darkness, to turn away from the evil in this world and towards the light and towards the good and to those things that fulfill rather than tear down, to turn towards Jesus. That's the legacy that Noah's wife leaves. But she doesn't end at just how she raises her family. It's how she responds to her husband. Noah comes home and tells her one day, God said I need to build a gigantic boat. That'd be an interesting conversation, wouldn't it? There's a movie that came out a number of years ago called Evan Almighty. And the premise of the movie was that a modern day man, who's actually a politician, is told by God that he needs to build an ark. And God does not relent. God does everything in his power to force Noah. He grows a long beard no matter how much he shaves. He's followed everywhere he goes by animals. Finally, he gives in and says, fine, I'll build the boat. But then what I love about this movie is it asks the realistic question of what do you do with that if you're his family? What do you do with that if you're his wife? 
And I'd like to show you a scene from that movie. There is a moment where Noah's, well, Evan in the movie, but the Noah character's wife has taken the kids and gone to live with her sister. And she's left him, and she's at a restaurant. And God, who was played by Morgan Freeman in this movie, comes to speak to her and explains why she should maybe reconsider how she thinks about this. And so I'd just like to, and it's uh, in a restaurant, I'd just like to share this scene with you. Oh, excuse me, can I get a refill, please? Coming right up. Excuse me, are you, are you all right? Yeah. No, it's a long story. Well, I like stories. I'm considered a bit of a storyteller myself. My husband? Have you heard of New York's Noah? <laughs> the guy who's building the ark. That's him. I love that story. No one in the ark? You know, a lot of people miss the point of that story. They think it's about God's wrath and anger. They love it when God gets angry. What is the story about then, the ark? Well, I think it's a love story about believing in each other. You know, the animals showed up in pairs. They stood by each other, side by side, just like Noah and his family. Everybody entered the ark side by side. But my husband says God told him to do it. What do you do with that? Sounds like an opportunity. Let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, you think God gives them patience? Or does he give them the opportunity to be patient. If they prayed for courage, does God give them courage, or does he give them opportunities to be courageous? If someone prayed for the family to be closer, do you think God zaps them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? <sighs> well, I gotta run. A lot of people to serve. Enjoy. I like that movie and I like that scene because I think that's such a realistic situation. Because if your spouse came home tomorrow and told you that they were going, or any loved one that's in your family, told them that God told them to build a giant boat in your backyard, you would have them committed, right? Rather than, or would you just let them build this giant boat in your backyard, right? Like, because it's crazy. It's crazy. But... What does she do with that? And of course in the movie she makes the decision to go back. And together they build this boat and the day is saved because they build the boat. And I think we have to ask ourselves, how do we respond to people when God is speaking to them? Especially when God is speaking to them in ways that we're not particularly comfortable with or on board with. Ways that might strike us as crazy. Because Noah's wife makes a decision to go along with what Noah is doing, right? We assume that because she ends up on the boat. So at po some point she has to be on board with the plan. We don't know how the conversation goes up to that point. But at some point she is with Noah. Because she believes that God has been speaking to him. And that God is working in him and through him. Now, I told you, those of you who were here the first couple of weeks, I was here as a pastor. I told you and I promised that I would do something while I was here as pastor. At least one time that probably you did not like. Maybe I've already done it. I don't know. But it's coming if it hasn't. The one other thing I will promise you is probably at some time while I am pastor here, the council and the leadership and I will do something that you might think is a little crazy. And my prayer to you is when that moment comes that we would remember Noah's wife and the story and be willing to embrace a little bit of crazy. Because my friends, crazy is the way that God works. When you read scripture, most of the stories are kind of crazy, right? Jesus feeds thousands of people with a, five, with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. That's insane. But it happened because people believed. 
The Israel, Israelite army walked around Jericho. That's all they did. They walked around it and they yelled and they played instruments and the entire city fell. That's crazy. But it happened because God willed it to. Are we willing to embrace the crazy things? Are we willing to do what, what the Lord is leading us to do? And I promise to you that I will embrace all of your crazy. If you come to me and you say, Pastor, I have an idea for a unicycle ministry. Because people need more unicycles in this world. And I feel closer to God when I'm on a unicycle. I might think you're crazy. But I'm going to say, tell me more about how God speaks to you through unicycles. I spoke about this at the 845 worship. I had at least three people come up and tell me how they ride unicycles. So maybe we're, on the, maybe we're on the verge of that ministry. I don't know. <laughs> because God works in crazy, interesting ways. We need to be willing to embrace that. Noah's wife was willing to embrace what her husband wanted to do because the Lord spoke to him. The Lord was leading him. And because she was willing to embrace that, her entire family was saved. They were able to rise above the waves and the things that seek to tear away and destroy and were able to rise. They were able to be saved. They were able to find respite from the world because they listened to God even when the thing didn't seem to make sense. Even when the thing was, seemed a little crazy, they followed God. We need to have faith in one another. The quote on the screen is from Henry David for Thoreau. We must have infinite faith in each other. I'm here to tell you that I disagree with Henry David Thoreau. Because I think humanity will always come up short. But we have infinite faith in each other when we are together in the Lord. And we know we are being led by God. And then we fall into what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians. I rejoice that in everything I have confidence in you. And Paul is telling that to the people of Corinth because he says, I have confidence in you because I know that the Spirit of God is moving within you. I know that you are led by the Spirit. And so as people of God, we need to follow the Lord where the Lord leads, even if it's crazy, even if it's different. And I have no idea what that is. I don't have a crazy plan to unveil in front of you right now. I'm asking you to follow if you're terrified and watching me. But I know, I know that amazing things are possible for this church. I know that amazing things are possible for this community. And if we agree, if we say, God, give us all the crazy that we can handle. Give us all the things that we can do for the Lord. If we do that, there is nothing that can stop us. There is nothing that can stop the spirit in this place and in this community. But we have to be willing to say yes. We have to be willing to be like Noah's wife and say, that sounds absurd, but sign me up anyway. Because God works through the crazy. God works through the sometimes illogical. God works through all things. So let us journey together. Let us get on that boat together and sail above the pain, the suffering, the things that seek to tear us down. And sail on towards the Lord. Would you bow your heads and join me in prayer? Almighty God, I thank you for this church family. I thank you for this group of believers. I thank you for this family of God. Lord, work in us. Work through us. Lord, help us to embrace one another. Lord, to have confidence in one another, knowing that the Spirit is moving in this place and moving in the hearts of those gathered here. Help us not to question, but Lord, to feel your Spirit. Help us to invite it into our midst, to not be scared of it, but to just embrace it. The crazy and all. Because Lord, we know you're ready to move. We feel it. And excites us. Help us to be part of that. We pray all of this in your holy name, Lord. Amen.